I'm Tangie with Foreclosures Daily. We are nationwide lead provider. We provide leads to investors, realtors, attorneys, and just your basic first time home buyer. We've been in business since 2004. And since then, we have been the internet's number one destination for the most detailed, timely, and accurate information. I'm Tangie Cousins. I've been with Foreclosures Daily since the very beginning, since they opened in 2004. And I have helped many investors, realtors, and attorneys grow their business and increase their revenues. I teach people the do's and don'ts of marketing, and you know the unique marketing techniques on how to get people to open your mail, you know what to say, what not to say, how often to mail, so on and so forth. I put my contact information on the bottom of the screen for you, so go ahead and take a picture of it or a screenshot if you want. That's how you contact me if you have any questions or, or anything. So we're very different from other companies out there. There's a lot of lead providers out there today, you guys. There's so many of them. It's just like, how do you know who to use, you know? Um, so a lot of times people will provide you with leads and they're not going to give you real estate attached. Real estate attached is very important. And this is what makes us different. All of our leads are daily, weekly, or fresh. Daily, weekly, or monthly. But most of the time they're going to be weekly. And they always have real estate attached. We do not give you leads unless there's real estate actually attached to there. Um, all of our leads will come with some sort of property appraiser's information on most of the data types that we have. Um, as much as we possibly can, like bedrooms, baths, type of property, so on and so forth, things like that. Most companies we've found are quarterly and they're not farming for property. That's a really big problem. You know, nobody wants to get leads that are already three months old, that's already been worked over by other investors. Most people want fresh leads. So we take pride in the fact that we have weekly fresh data and we understand the importance of having that data. And farming for real estate is really imperative. And any company I've found so far that does like probate, pre-probate, divorce, stuff like that, they're not farming for property. That's a problem. 300 people will file probate or divorce in one week maybe only seven to 10% of them are going to physically own real estate. So these are some of the leads that we can provide you with here at Foreclosures Daily is probates, pre-probates, inheritance, code violation, eviction, and divorce. Those are the six main lead types I'd like to go over because those are my absolute favorite because those are the actual hottest leads there are. Now, when you work these types of leads, you're going to be working a small group of people, but you're going to be yielding massive returns. So such huge returns than working numbers like by volume. A lot of people tell you, hey, you've got to work thousands and thousands of leads to make such and such dollars. That's not the case with these types. With these types of leads, you're going to be working a small group of people, but yielding much higher returns. So that means less money in marketing, less money in mailing, less money skip tracing, less money calling, less money all the way around cheaper and way better returns. So probates and pre-probates by far are some of the best leads you'll ever get. Honestly, they have a lot of equity. They typically don't mind taking a discount and they're very, very motivated to sell. People tend to be much older when they lose their parents. So they usually do not want the property guys. They usually want to sell the property. Now, because they didn't typically buy the property, that means they have no skin in the game and they usually don't mind taking deeply discounted rates for buying the properties. And you can usually get them for wholesale discounted prices. So probates and pre-probates are honestly my favorite out of all the leads that we offer. Um, divorce leads are really good. It's for it's like one week after they file for divorce. And you know, the house is usually the big headache. It's usually the big fight, right? The one that takes a year to get over. So if you scoop in there as an investor and offer them a cash deal for their property, they could sell and get out of it now. A lot of times they'll do that if they're not one of them are planning on staying in the property. A lot of times they'll sell and just that will help them alleviate a year's headache of fighting over the property. So divorce leads are really good too. Code violations, you know, you're dealing with the overgrown trash and debris, you know, stuff like that. Hey, Javier, you're, you're dealing with overgrown trash and debris, things like that. So, I mean, code violations are really good. Evictions are good. You know, you're typically dealing with tired landlords, you know, so um, you definitely want to work things like that. These are all weekly and fresh. They're all being farmed for physical real estate. Now, these are some of the postcards that I do recommend when you use our list. Um, the postcards with the properties are huge right now, guys. The national average response rate for any mailing is like a half to one and a half percent. I literally have people getting three, five, 10, and 15% response rates on these types of postcards. A lot of companies out there will charge like a dollar per postcard. I got this one company set up for you guys to only charge 42 cents per postcard, and that's with postage. 
So it's pretty awesome. I also um, recommend a handwritten letter. This company actually does handwritten letters for you and they only charge 64 cents with postage and they use a handwritten font. So it makes it look like you actually wrote the letter yourself. I also give you bonuses. You get a lot of different bonuses when you buy leads to foreclosures daily. And one of the major bonuses that we do give you is the mailing and the skip tracing companies, right? Those are the two hottest things you wanna know and have in your pocket when you're going to invest because that's the way you're gonna reach out to these people. So when we recommend the mailhouse company, they're gonna give you deeply discounted rates as well as our speaker tonight is also gonna give you deeply discounted rates. Anybody we refer over to ClearSkip, you're gonna get a discounted rate with a special code that we're gonna give you for everybody who buys. One of the bonuses that we're giving out tonight for anybody who stays on for the entire webinar, we're gonna give you a free county for anybody who signs up between now and Friday for any of the leads that we offer here at Foreclosures Daily at the discounted rate. So we will go over the prices when the webinar is done and let you know how much we're going to charge for the leads to get that free county by the end of this week, so Friday. We also mail a probate book to your actual property and we physically know the author. He flew here to meet us and we did a webinar with him teaching the seven ways to make money with probate real estate investing. So we're gonna share his webinar replay with you as well as actually physically snail mail his book to you called Probate Real Estate Sales 101. And his name is Kevin Sales, that's S-A-Y-L-E-S. -E so he wrote that book and he also has another book out that he wrote about investing, so. But these are some of the things that we'll give you. And I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen here for a moment because we're gonna be introducing our speaker and that is Javier Suarez. And he is an investor. He's been an investor for eight years. He's also a developer. He also runs a private equity company. I can't say enough about this guy. He also, he also does flipping, he wholesales, he has rentals. He, he's skip tracing. He's owned this skip tracing company for many, many years. And he's gonna teach you guys how to um how to get out of wholesaling and into investing right and um he also he um is going to teach you guys how to climb the real estate ladder so without further ado javier suarez hi hi you're way too nice how are you <laughs> yeah you're way too nice tangy it's been a pleasure to working with you for the last couple of years i don't think anybody knows how much money we've actually spent with your company and uh, how much it's actually paid off. I don't think you guys get enough credit. You guys have just been in the shadows and you support so many businesses. So it's so awesome to see, you know, you guys grow at this level too. Thank you. We appreciate you. I'm gonna um, go ahead and give you the floor and I'll let, I'll let me know when you're ready to open up to Q&A, okay? Awesome, let's do it. All right, you can go ahead and share your screen if you'd like. I went ahead and stopped mine, so. Awesome, give me a sec. Cool. So before we jump into it, um, yeah, just a little bit about myself. Um, I started in real estate when I was 19 years old, and I was actually supposed to go to the military at 18, and I decided that that was just not the path for me. Um, I wanted to be my own boss. I had no idea what that meant. And I actually watched my grandmother sacrifice everything coming from a country, Cuba, uh, with literally no money in her pocket. She came to America with a bag of diapers and cigars and my four uncles. And she ended up selling all of her uh, cigars when she got here to be able to pay for our first apartment. So I actually grew up, she became a self-made millionaire, self millionaire in real estate. <clears throat> I think by the time she was like 45, 50, and um, I ended up just growing up around that, seeing her work. My mother is an interior designer for commercial real estate companies as well. So I kind of grew up around that and uh, you know, was able to walk sites like the Pentagon after it got hit, and which is exposed to a lot of real estate. So uh, I think I got the lucky side of the coin, but by no means at all was anything given. Um, <laughs> but I put a little presentation together for everybody. Um, one of the biggest things I think that uh, for me is a lot of my pain of getting to where I am today. Uh, I really don't want to go in vain. And uh, I wanted to, whoever's watching this today to get, you know, hopefully a couple little nuggets to maybe break out of the rat race. That to me is wholesaling and middlemanning a lot of deals and actually move up the ladder and be keeping a lot more of the, the deal that you're selling. 
So uh, I really channeling today on how to go from wholesale to general partner. So if you don't know what a general partner means, sometimes you actually hear the word GP and GP is general partner and you have LP limited partner. When you have a company to, if you're a wholesaler and you're selling it, a property to a company, you have the general partner, normally the guy who's negotiating the deal. And then you have the LP, the guy who's supplying the money to the general partner. And uh, I'll explain a little bit more about that, uh, you know, in today's presentation. So some fun stuff. Uh, again, I'm going to go into a little bit more into depth of who I am, uh, get off my soapbox and get into some real nitty gritty stuff, give you some numbers. Um, but yeah, my name is Javier Suarez, uh, born and raised in the DMV. We call that DC, Maryland, Virginia. I am from Virginia, Virginia boy, proud, proud Virginia. And um, yeah, by the age of 23, I'd sold $25 million. Uh, when I was 19 years old, I started as a wholesaler. And that started, that was probably a month that that lasted. And uh, I started cold calling about 200 to 300 calls every single day. This is before power dialers. This is before CRMs. This is before a lot of the gurus um, had YouTube about, hey, this is how you do it. I, I wasn't one of the guys who, oh, I watched somebody's uh, DVDs or anything like that. I'm ground up. I literally got an Excel, uh, Excel list and was started calling numbers, dialing numbers and trying to figure out, hey, how are you going to sell your, uh, your property for half of the market value to a guy who's never done a deal before? Um, and I realized that it wasn't my calling to become a wholesaler at first. And I was going to go to the path of least resistance because a lot of the people that I talked to wanted to actually sell their home, but not 50% off. So I got my license. So back to 23, by the age of 23, I had got my agent's license and I sold $25 million worth of real estate. That's nothing to shake a stick at. A lot of sleepless nights, a lot of sacrifice, but a lot of repetition on a lot of bad properties, but definitely some hustle that went into that. Um, year to or year to date, my lifetime to date, I'm well above $50 million in sales and just transacted real estate volume. Very proud of that. It's pretty cool. I think, um, but, uh, yeah, my company's last year did over a million dollars in revenue. Um, we didn't even do that much real estate. Uh, you'll see, and I'll get into it a little bit more. We don't do as much volume as we do, uh, the size of deals. Uh, so my core business, we do real estate, my side business, we do real investment services for real estate investors. So that includes skip tracing and consulting. Um, so that business alone, we've hit $2 million in lifetime sales. Uh, it's a three year company. Um, and yeah, like I mentioned, I started as a wholesaler. I started as a wholesaler and I failed. I did so bad. I had no idea. I didn't have scripts. I didn't know how to close anybody. I thought I was so good. And then I got in front of somebody who I thought that they were going to be at the same caliber and wanted to fight me. And then I realized is that when I was calling people, they actually needed my help. And it hit me like a brick um, when I talked to people and I actually was listening to their problems and I had to get past my profit. And when I realized that the business wasn't just about money, but it was actually about sol you know, solution oriented uh, 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 strategies, I realized that becoming an agent actually cut my profit a little bit more so, but it gave me a lot more of a barrier of entry, being able to understand the business. And I think taking that approach actually contributed to a lot of my success. Um, after becoming an agent though, I did get back into wholesale because you realize you want to make a nice coin. And uh, I got back into wholesale. Uh, I was working with a na nationwide company and uh, worked my way up from COO to CEO of that company. And we were doing an average of anywhere from 35 to 50 deals a month in about nine different cities. So that was pretty cool. That goes obviously natural progression, progression of anybody who does any more than 10 deals in wholesale, you become an educator and uh, it's cool to be a part of a education company that we went nationwide. We made it, made it to uh, a few different, uh, very national rankings that a lot of people know the whole real, real empire brand is a great to be a part of that. Um, but I realized in the whole education system, that wasn't really my calling. You know, I'm a hustler, I'm a deal maker. And what I like to do is I like systems, I like pro formas, I like closing and I like owning. So that's kind of the big thing I'm going to be getting in today, guys, is how you go from wholesale to the actual general partner owning the real estate and making the money that you see you're selling to a lot of your partners in the back end. 
So the big thing today, guys, of how I got here, it's systems and pro formas. My absolute secret sauce, if you don't know what a pro forma is, shoot that in the comments. We'll go into that a little bit more in detail. But a pro forma is literally the numbers of what you buy it for, what you put into it, and then what you sell it for, what your profit is in, rel in relation to the investment that you make to the property. So on the next slide, what do I do? Um, I look at deals that have a $500,000 profit minimum. Okay, so a lot to a lot of people, you see a projected profit of ten to twenty thousand dollars. Well, I think when we were wholesaling, my average profit size was about twenty. It was about fifteen thousand dollars on average. You sell it out, you know, you market out at twenty thousand dollars. You end up making a deal with somebody else at fifteen, and then at the end of the day, you get a couple, you know, cut a couple of bucks off of it. And you'll make ten grand if you're lucky. Um, so that was cool, but now. Uh, my minimum deal size that I look at is $500,000. And I got three deals right now that we're doing that are well above $5 million each in profit, which is really great to say, and looking back at it, it's kind of crazy thinking about, you know, I, I would have been so happy to tell, you know, if you ever told me that I do one deal above a million dollars in my lifetime. Now I have three all above a uh, $5 million profit. Um, which is really cool. But yeah, my minimum that I do look at is a $500,000 profit. Uh, I closed my first half million dollar deal last year. It was a 12 unit property, which was pretty cool, but opened my eyes to a whole bunch of things. Um, other things that I do, I develop, I develop multifamily buildings, I develop mixed use buildings, and I have one luxury single family project that we're doing. Um, I don't like single family projects anymore. Uh, it's just very small. Um, but yeah, so some of the projects that I'm doing currently, I have a 40 unit new construction apartment build, building being built. Um, I've got a 66 unit mixed use building being built. Um, and I have a 44 unit office building that I am purchasing, which is existing. So uh, some numbers on these, I'll give you kind of the rundown, the 40 unit office building, I bought the land for uh, 300,000 is three parcels. I put it into one. So I'm in it 300,000 in acquisition construction, $6.7 million in the ARV on that property is $15 million. Uh, the 66 unit building, I'm buying the building for 2.5 million. My construction is 6.5 million and my, uh, I have an appraisal on the building. So when it's all said and done, uh, the appraisals at $17 million but I know the building's going to be worth $25 million at the end of the day. So on paper, we're looking at about a $9 million profit. I think at the end of the day, it should turn out to be about a $15 million profit done in two years. We'll make about seven and a half over uh, two years, which would be nice. And then a uh, 44 unit office building, I'm buying it at $2.2 million and I'm not putting anything in the building. I'm just raising rents and the building should be worth about $6.5 million by the end of this year. So if you're interested in taking a look at that office building, you can actually visit investinoffices.com and you can go through, it takes you to the investment portal on our side and gives you a brief little synopsis about the property, has some of the pro formas and information about those deals. So um, it's kind of fun. Um, so why do I do it? Okay, this is kind of the everybody's thing when they go into it, the Tony Robbins, why do you do it? Why do you get up? What's your motivation? What's your why? Um, you know, you growing up, I thought it was money and, and freedom and all of this stuff. I didn't really discover my why until last year. Um, I thought I knew about my why. I thought it was, you know, hustle, make a name, legacy, all that kind of things. I really come to find, that, find out at the end of the day is um, a lot of people sacrificed for me. And I was tired of seeing the people that I love most sacrifice for me. So I wanted to be the one who actually sacrificed. And my why was my family. Um, come to find out, I didn't have much of a family growing up, uh, but I've got a really big family now. And, and that's why I say, you know, last year uh, was a big part of my why. Uh, my grandmother, as I mentioned in the beginning of this, uh, this webinar, she actually came from Cuba. My family was persecuted out of Cuba. They were attorneys, and when uh, Fidel Castro uh, came into power, they ended up showing up at my front doorstep, uh, my family's front doorstep in Cuba, and they were looking for my dad and his brothers uh, to join the military, and they, you know, my family actually was not home at that time. They went straight to the airport and uh, ended up fleeing and coming to Washington, D.C., 
And um, that was really powerful growing up and hearing the stories my grandmother used to tell me. My father actually passed when I was two years old. So unfortunately, I haven't been able to talk to him about that. God bless him. And, um, you know, as I mentioned, my dad passed away when I was two. Uh, and I was, you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, I was able to see my mother sacrifice everything for me as well. So I had, you know, two of the women that I love most in my life sacrifice everything for me. And um, obviously, I just got married uh, this past week uh, to Joanna, absolute beautiful marriage of ours. But we were fortunate enough to have a very healthy baby girl last year. And that was a big part of my why. My why of uh, why I keep going, but also why I keep pushing myself to go bigger um, is being able to hold my daughter. It showed me a lot that freedom uh, to be with my family was what mattered most. And when I was wholesaling and when I was middlemaning uh, a lot of deals, I did not have the freedom because I was at the whim of my buyer. I was at the whim of my seller. Uh, my profit margins on my deals were so small. I did not have the ability to be able to go and do what I wanted to because if I wasn't on the phones, if I couldn't answer questions, if I couldn't handle a contract, everything was very bing, 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 bing. And if you miss one thing, you know, there goes a $20,000 profit. A buyer doesn't perform. There goes $50,000, whatever it was. I couldn't live like that. I just wanted to be with my baby girl. And, um, a big part of me, I wanted to break the general generational curse of having to sacrifice um, for the ones that I loved most. Um, I wanted to be the last one to sacrifice and make my sacrifice count for at least three to four generations down the road and have a Rockefeller type impact into my family. Um, so I am 28 years old as well. So I've been able to accomplish this by the grace of God in you know, the last nine years since I started you know, at 19. I'm 28 years old now. Um, and, and being able to go to my very deep why of my family, that is my, my true, true why of why I wake up every morning and go harder than absolutely anybody you put me up against. I, I swear I work harder than almost anybody else in the industry. Um, and that's why, because my family sacrificed everything there. And, and I'll go toe to toe on that. You'll see, I, I'm in the office till midnight every night. Um, ask my wife. <laughs> um, why do I, why do I do bigger deals? Why, why, why do I do commercial deals? Uh, why did I stop doing single family deals? Um, first for me is I couldn't find enough single family homes to flip. Uh, my core market is in Tampa, Florida. Um, I like working in my own market in Tampa, Florida. We actually have 50%, we're a 50% deficiency of the rest of the United States. Uh, for the amount of homes we have to the amount of housing that is required. I think that's actually gone down even more significantly in the last year. Um, does that, I, I can't find enough homes to flip. Uh, I couldn't find enough homes to wholesale. I couldn't find enough homes to flip um, to be able to make, you know, to support you know, my business and my goals um, to grow. And uh, I needed stability. Uh, I couldn't grow hoping that a buyer would close on time, uh, especially on a property that I didn't own. Uh, I, I, I could not find enough inventory to support my goals, okay? And I think that's gonna be really important what I wanted to show um, everybody and what they're doing uh, currently in their business models. A lot of people who are probably watching this are wholesalers who are agents, and you're probably making either a commission or you're making a fee off of the properties that you uh, sell and you're probably keeping anywhere from 20 to 30%, probably even less than that for most people of your business. So off of a $10,000 fee, you're probably making $3,000 on that just uh, after paying everybody, after paying marketing expenses and stuff, whether you realize it on there. I suggest everybody look at your actual net profit of every single month after you pay all of your marketing expenses, even annual if you need to. Um, most wholesaling businesses, I don't think actually can survive uh, past two to three years because in growth, you end up occurring a lot of expenses three months and then, you know, can put you out of business. So, um, you know, every business goes through that. So if you're experiencing that yourself, I don't want you to ever beat yourself up and say, man, you know what, I'm not good or anything like that. Your business model just sucks, you know, and that's why I'm here today. Um, what I ended up learning was, uh, yeah, what I ended up learning was, what, what hit me, it, this hit me like a bag of bricks. I had uh, 35 deals on a Plecto board 
And what we did is we had our acquisitions price, we had our recommended uh, rehab costs, and then we had our ARV, and then we had our projected profit, right? Everybody has this magical projected profit when you call your investors to say, yeah, you can, you can make this kind of money. Um, we stood by our projected profit numbers. And I remember looking at the boards to say, yo, well, what deal are we going to sell first, right? When you're looking at 30 deals on a board, it's really hard to discern of what deal am I going to go pitch to a buyer this morning, right? And um, especially when you have 30 of them, you have to be able to make a snap decision on what deal do I want to focus on first. Um, what I used was how much profit and what was the best ROI uh, to be able to go sell to an investor. What was my easiest deal to be able to pitch, right? Are you going to make $10,000, you know, as the buyer selling a rental? Or are you going to turn around and make $120,000 on a flip in Atlanta, right? The flip in Atlanta was so much easier to do especially flips in Tampa. Everybody's been loving Tampa, especially this past year. Um, but that's where it hit me. I looked at that projected profit to say, if I'm going to be $15,000 wholesale fee and my buyer's going to be making a $45,000 profit and they're not even going to use their own capital, why the hell wouldn't I just flip the damn property? It was a really easy decision for me at the end of the day to realize is that most wholesales um, you can actually triple your profit by just closing on the property. Um, I decided uh, when I made the jump from wholesale to actually buying my first property and actually taking down my first property, um, I had my same criteria. If I was going to make $15,000 on the wholesale fee, I wanted to at least make three times that amount on there. So once I hit uh, a wholesale deal in Tampa, Florida, and I saw that, I actually jumped on the immediate chance to do that. And uh, I, the day that I actually closed on the property, I actually bought it from our company for $80,000 and I got an appraisal back from the bank for $120,000. So uh, technically on paper, I made $40,000 the day that I bought the property. I wish I actually just kept it and I didn't do anything because we ended up making $45,000 profit after renovating the whole property. So in hindsight, it's always 2020, but um, best decision I ever did was start to close on my own deals. Um, it actually started way before when I uh, was an agent on that closing and owning and doing the deals made sense. Um, so I'll actually jump back to when I was 20 years old, right? 19, I didn't know freaking anything. Um, when I was 20, I realized that there was a lot of investors, a lot of the same buyers were actually making me offers on a lot of the same properties that I was listing. And uh, I, I jumped out and I asked a lot of the buyers that I was working with, you know, why are you buying the property, right? At 20 years old, you have no idea what's going on. Most 20 years old, I know some 20 years old, they're, they're incredible. But most 20 years old, uh, I'm a normal kind of guy. I was a normal 20 years old. I had no idea of anything. I didn't know construction numbers. I didn't know rehabs. Um, I didn't know finishes. I didn't know anything like that. So what I did was I started asking the flippers, that I was selling to, you know, what model are you using to evaluate my property that you're buying? And why does this make sense for you, right? How much, you know, why, why do you need to buy it at this price? And how much are you going to put into it to sell it, right? I'll still sell it to you. Just kind of give me a little secret sauce on, on, on what you're doing with the property. So it started with flipping, very basic. You buy a property, put some money into it, and then you have your exit numbers. It was more money and profit than I was making in my first job by tenfold. Um, and then flipping actually became development. I, I started working with a lot of people who were rushing to my properties in Washington, DC. You have very, these tiny, tiny properties. So you can't go out, you can go up. And I had a lot of people who were buying my row homes who were actually uh, uh, very happy to buy these. And when I asked them the question, what are you doing with it? They told me condo conversion. So for anybody who doesn't know what a condo conversion is, you are converting a single family home into multiple condos. It could be two, three, four, five condos um, in one building. And if you buy a property for $600,000 and you put another $400,000 into the property, you're in it for a million dollars. But if you sell each condo for $700,000 on the bottom and $800,000 on the top, that's a $1.5 million out sale. And you're only in it for $1 million. Instead of flipping it and making $100,000, you're now making half a million dollars, right? On the same property. And again, you're not really using any of your own cash at the end of the day. So that's where the light bulb went off for me to say, wow, 
you know, I one day want to get to these bigger properties. I don't know how to get there. So I'm going to just keep climbing the ladder, be a really nice guy selling these properties and, uh, you know, eventually, you know, take my seat, uh, you know, when I got there. Right. So my model, when I was 19 years old, when I was 20 years old, I started, I got an Excel sheet from one of the flippers and I took that Excel sheet and it had my acquisition, my rehab and my ARV and it spit out an ROI. That same Excel sheet over the nine years has evolved to what my company has built our foundation on. And that pro forma goes and it tells me exactly every time that I evaluate a property at what price that I buy it to what, how much that I'm putting into it to how I exit. And that is how I size up every single one of my deals. So anybody who currently is just buying a property and you're just selling it to somebody else, stop that. Stop selling a property and not understanding why you're selling the property. When you sell a property to somebody else, you need to understand how much money and why they're selling this property. Why, why is somebody going to buy this property from you? And don't just think about, hey, I'm going to collect a $15,000 check really quick. What's next? Think about, hey, why didn't I buy the property? Why wasn't I in position to be able to go capitalize on the other side? Because you can actually wholesale yourself a property to then go do the flip. And that's what we did for a while. And it's a great model. It's a great strategy with single family homes. But instead of a wholesaling fee, when you get to commercial properties, they actually call it an acquisitions fee. And it's acceptable by people. And you don't have to do all these you know, shady wholesale uh, strategies to it. So that's the first thing is understand your model. Stop selling properties without a model, get a model and perfect it. And that's the first thing that I did to get myself to where I am today. Second thing that I did, I asked God, I was very thoughtful on what I wanted. And then I asked God to bless me with that. And in turn, I wanted to be a generous giver. So when you petition to God on something that truly is in your heart, it is okay to ask. And that is one of the first things that I would tell anybody is, is that don't own this alone. God created this whole world. He wants to see you win. Take time and ask God for big prayers and big victories and ask very, very, ask knowing that you're going to receive. Okay. Uh, third, I changed my circle. So I was hanging when I was a wholesaler and I was doing 35, 50 deals a month. I was spending a lot of time with a lot of other wholesalers. And all I knew was wholesaling. And it was so cool because it's like, yo, you're doing this deal. You're doing this deal. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, but that conversation never became like, yo, how do I get to a million dollar deal? Right? None of my friends were doing million dollar deals. For me, I knew a million dollars was very achievable because the guys that I was selling it to, all of them were making eight, $10 million a year. And to me, that was very foreign, but the, my circle you know, they didn't want to talk about these big deals. All we wanted to talk about, hey, how fast you know, were we able to sell this deal? And, you know, wow, I got, you know, this, you know, grandmother down $20,000 on her property and I flipped it around. To me, that wasn't really too interesting, right? For me, I wanted to be able to make, you know, a million dollars in one deal, take my family out, you know, on a trip and be able to, you know, not look at a bill, right? Not that I was looking at a bill when we were wholesaling, but I wanted to be able to make enough money that uh, I, I was able to, uh, 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 kind of look at my past and say, you know, that was nice and I'm never going to be going back to it. And I was able to break that change by hanging out with people who are actually making that money. So I started becoming a lot more friends with developers, uh, people who were uh, buying commercial properties, people who wanted you, who, people who were, I wanted to be. Okay. So you have to completely change your conversation. Your conversation is going to affect who you are and what you are tremendously. Um, the next thing that I did is as a middleman, as an agent, you are living almost month to month. You were looking at every month's p &L. How much did I make this month? How much did I lose this month? You're looking at every single month, bum, 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 bum. And it is a chaotic cycle. It's actually how most of America lives their life, right? They live month to month, day by day. Uh, I ended up hiring a mentor. And that mentor told me the first thing that you need to do is you need to change your thinking. And the first thing that you have to do is pay six months in advance. If you don't have six months to be able of, of cash to be able to pay your expenses, pay as much as you can. I think at the time I didn't even pay six months. I didn't have that much cash. I had like three months of my expenses that I could pay. I paid rent. 
I paid uh, whatever marketing costs that I could. I paid my car. I paid a couple of different things that I, I knew I had to pay in the next couple of months ahead of me. I would recommend six months if you can. But what that caused me to do is I stopped looking at the decisions in front of me of what I had to do to be able to make my money next month. And I was able to look at decisions that were able to influence my yearly goal and get me closer and make bigger decisions and not just decisions that were going to get me in the right now. Um, the next thing that I did is I focused on my credit. I, I had a bunch of BS charges and stupid little things on my credit that I never cared about because as a wholesaler, yeah, you don't need credit, right? You know, you're using somebody else's house and somebody else's cash to do a deal that's not even yours. And, you know, you're collecting checks and, you know, you got so much cash, it doesn't even matter. Um, I realized that I, I couldn't live like that. I needed to make sure that my credit was good so I could go get better debt because anytime that you go buy a property, you're going to need to have your credit pulled and you get better loans and you get let you, you get to keep more money, the better your credit is. Okay. Um, so what I did is I focused on building my credit, right? So I paid out my, my future expenses. I uh, made sure that my credit was much better. And I made sure is, is that I had somebody who was going to take a chance on me in the form of a lender, right? There's private, and then there's public lenders and public lenders can be hard money lenders, banks, um, you know, anybody you know, institutionally who will give you a loan. Most people uh, who are going from wholesaling to flipping um, or even just rentals, you're going to be using a hard money lender 99% of the times. And you're going to be at a rate between eight to 12%. What I did was I found a whole bunch of lenders and I found a whole bunch of people who were going to give me loans when I went to go close on a property. If you are going to be going and closing on your first property, don't expect to have the best loan. Expect that when you start working with lenders, you're going to have to start high and you start working your way down the more credibility that you have. Um, and, and, and I'm not even going to talk about, you know, really it flipping at all. I, I wish I just completely skipped that part of my life. That's the only time I've ever lost money. I've only lost money on one deal and it was a flip because we bust down a wall and you find out you got $30,000 more in expenses than you, you could have imagined ever doing. It is bound to happen in flipping, okay? What I realized was um, I couldn't find enough single family houses, you know, in flipping. I couldn't find enough good deals. Um, I, I, I had decent credit this time. I paid off expenses and I realized that, hey, you know what? My goals are big, my hopes are big, my dreams or aspirations are big. I can go bigger, but how do I do it? Okay. I already set course. I'm already here and I'm trying to find enough properties to be able to flip, but how the F do I get there? Okay. No one's going to give you the answer. Um, but you ask God and he'll give you a blessing. Um, I ask God, Hey Lord, how, how do I get to this point in my life that I'm able to uh, generate enough revenue in my business that I'm going to be able to uh, uh, take care of my goals, hit my, uh, hit my revenue goals, be able to, to feel happy, to be fulfilled. And it really dawned on me, let's go buy multifamily properties. And it's like, you would really think it's a pretty simple concept, but when all you know is single family real estate, making that jump from single family to multifamily, it's almost, it's foreign to most people to go and do a bigger deal. For me, when I started looking through uh, multifamily deals and how to break it down, you have all these gurus talking about hundred unit properties and all these big properties and stuff. None of that made sense to me. Um, how I approached my multifamily approach uh, was I was gonna buy a multifamily building and if it had 10 units and I was gonna buy it for a million dollars, that means I'm buying each unit for $100,000, okay? Then I needed to look at what were the going rates for properties in the area, okay? Well, I was looking at other multifamily properties and the other multifamily properties were be selling around $150,000 to $180,000, right? Let's use $150,000 was kind of my base number. And if I bought it at $100,000 and my, my, uh, my out sales were $150,000 a unit, I was able to put maybe $10,000, $20,000 a unit, you know, a hundred, I would be in it, 120 a unit. That's 30,000 in profit. If I'm selling it at 150, 30,000 over 10 units, that's $300,000 in just one building. So for me, that's how I approached multifamily real estate, just made it really simple. 
Um, and once I felt comfortable of approaching the deal, what I did was I bought a multifamily list and I skip trace that list with my company. So as Tanji mentioned before, I own clearskip.com. Clearskip.com is a nationwide uh, real estate skip tracing platform that we are able to do the basics skip tracing. We are able to do LLC skip tracing. So if a company owns a property, most platforms that you use are not going to be able to get you in front of the owner who owns it like a shell company because is that they have this corporate veil. Well, ClearSkip, we're able to pierce that corporate veil and get you the 10 phone numbers, 10 email addresses, and get you in front of these sellers who have a whole bunch of property. And what we found out was the absentee in-state property list was the bomb. All of these people who had these rental properties, they had one LLC and they had their retirement set across you know six different properties. Um, that was our sweet spot. So I bought a multifamily list. I got it skip trace with skip uh, with uh, clear skip. And I kid you not, on the third call that we made on this list, uh, I had my acquisitions guy give me a call and he said, "Hey, Javi, uh, I've got a seller down the down the street here in Tampa, and he's got a duplex, but he has uh, five other duplexes right next to it. So that's six duplexes, six times two. That's twelve units." And so I told him, hey, I'd be on the way. And I was there in about 10 minutes. Uh, we pulled up the property. I had no idea what I was doing. I pulled up CoStar. Um, that's one of the things I recommend if anybody wants to do bigger deals, go get CoStar. Um, and and, and Tanji's going to post my contact information later. I can get you a better rate on CoStar. But I looked on CoStar. I saw that the average unit was selling for about 125 a unit and uh, not renovated and a renovated unit was selling for about 180 a unit. So I went out and I met the seller and I said, hey man, I've done so many of these, you wouldn't even believe it. If I told you how many deals that I've done, yeah, obviously you sell it out your, your rear end. And the guy loved me, he's like, you're a nice guy. Obviously you have no idea what you're doing, but I'll give you a chance and I'll sell you my property, right? So by the grace of God, I got a contract to these 12 units. Um, I had a 30 day due diligence period and I had a 60 day close. Uh, title took a long time to be able to close. So I think we had ended up closing. It took like four months to close this transaction. And we actually closed this property uh, a day before the day after the day before my daughter was born. So I remember being at the hospital the day that my daughter was born, driving to the title company, signing it, driving back, and then my daughter being born craziest experience of my life. Um, but it was the absolute greatest thing. So when we put this law well, back it up a little bit, when I put the property under contract, um, I did on my pro forma and I talked to my lender and they said, Hey, Javier, you're going to need about $300,000, um, to close this property. Okay. Well, at the time I didn't have $300,000 just lying around that I could put into this property, um, you know, just as a down payment. Um, but what I was able to do was I had my buyer's list. I had my investor's list. I had all of these lists that I've been working on for years and years and people who genuinely, they knew me. Um, and what we were doing is, is that we actually turned our buyer's list and I turned my base of people that already knew me and I turned them into my investor's list. And I turned around to say, Hey, you know, I, I've got this building right here. I think I can buy this property. We put it under contract. I bought it for 1.4. That's, that was my acquisitions price. Bought it for 1.4. We ended up selling it to our own company for 1.5. So when I actually closed on the property, uh, I made $100,000. Um, so really for the sake of numbers, uh, you know, really my purchase price is $1.5 million. Um, my budget was $200,000 to renovate the property. And my, uh, uh, my plan was to sell it for $2.1 million. So I, would, I was looking to make about $400,000 on the property and I was willing to give up about $100,000 in profit of that profit. So if I made $300,000 at the time, I was so happy, right? I had no idea, I'd never done a multifamily property at that time, but it showed me, uh, it really had the same function of a single family flip, just there's 12 of them. And normally if you buy more, you get, things a lot cheaper. So that was kind of my back of the napkin math. So bought it at 1.5, planning on putting 200,000 into it, plan on sell for 2.1, make 400,000. It seemed like a good deal. 
I told this to my investors. I uh, got all of my investors together. We ended up raising about four hundred, about four hundred thousand dollars into the deal. We over raised a little bit, and we were able to pay the lender a couple of months in advance, um, not having to have the pressure. The same principle that I learned a couple uh, months before. Uh, I learned not to play your game month to month, but that's a strategy that I implemented and we implement to all of our deals we do now is to pay about six months in advance of holding cost. The reason that ended up working really well was the, uh, the investors didn't feel the pressure that I needed to perform, that the property didn't need to uh, generate cash flow every single month to be able to hold itself up. We were able to uh, have a breathing room and make very smart decisions on the building. So very cool thing about that building was uh, it was fully occupied. Uh, all 12 units were renting for about $1,000 a month. When I closed on the property, uh, we ended up raising the rents. Uh, we sent a letter to all of the tenants saying, hey, your new monthly rent, because everyone was month to month, we're going to be making you guys sign leases at $1,200 a month. Well, nobody called this back. So uh, you know, we, we didn't want to be cute and we ended up uh, raising the rent another hundred dollars the next month and said, well, you know, we know where this is going to be headed. Just go ahead and sign the lease and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get you locked in. We'll make the improvements to the property. And it was a good day. Um, they did. The majority of the building ended up signing the, the, the leases at 1300. We had a few tenants that exited and we ended up signing the building uh, two other units that became vacant at 1500 a month. And uh, the property was generating about $15,000 a month in gross cash flow. At the end of the day, after paying uh, you know, a, a, a reserve debt service and management and expenses at the end of the day, I was keeping about $3,000 in just rental cash flow that I was not expecting before, but it opened my eyes up to a lot of rental opportunities and how to evaluate rental properties. And um, it was very, very cool. Um, what I learned was the owner of the property before basically never uh, 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 did much to any of the units. He was too afraid of raising rents. He didn't want to, um, you know, be too aggressive because why not? You know, he owned the building. He didn't have any debt on the property and um, it just seemed really good. But I realized that uh, one of the things that I thrived in on my companies before was organization management, and I knew how to find good cheap property and through flipping and improving property and working with a lot of investors and developers, I learned how to improve those properties and where to spend the right money in the right places. So um, one of the, the you know, big things that I learned going into my next big deal was uh, when you go bigger, right, you actually don't have to spend as much uh, on detail than you would a flip. A flip, uh, when you're going and buying a flip, you're having to spend a lot of money in places that are gonna end result to somebody, one buyer wanting to spend a little bit more on your property. What ends up happening when you're buying larger commercial properties, such as multifamily buildings and office spaces, you actually are just improving the things to be able to increase the rents because the end buyer doesn't care if you have a certain fixture, a certain finish at the end of the day. When you get to larger deals, such as you know commercial deals, you are actually just going to be evaluating the property based upon a cap rate. So the cap rate is the going rate for commercial properties in your area based upon what kind of asset you're trading. So if you're trading an office building, if you're trading a multifamily building, whatever it is. I had no clue about this, by the way, when I went to buy my first property. Um, but when you have anything above about a five unit property and it's rented, you're going to be evaluating your property against other five units or multi-unit properties that are being rented at that same price. They don't look at it the same way a house to say, oh, well, five unit building sold for this. You're actually just evaluating what's the maximum cash flow that I can be getting out there versus what the efficiency in the building is to what net cash am I keeping at the end of every month and at the end of the year. Uh, and you divide that by the cap rate and it gives you a good price. Um, so what I learned with all of this and how did I do it is I started with my end in mind, okay? Um, I'm going to show you some uh, some some uh, maps and diagrams of what I do to evaluate properties of what markets I want to be investing in personally. Um, but when I start with the end in mind is I'm looking at the deal, um, how I want it to finish, not where do I want to start, but how do I want to finish? Not necessarily how much profit, but what, if, what can I sell it for? And if I start reverse engineering, if I'm going to be selling at X price, I need to be buying at Y because I expect that, you know, if I buy a decent property and there's not much renovation that goes into it, my profit margin is going to be pretty healthy. 
Um, I, I don't recommend buying, you know, super distressed property that's like falling apart just because that's where you can, you know, have a hiccup and have some surprises and you don't want surprises when you're owning and buying your own property. Um, so yeah, start with the end in mind, uh, understand your goals and implement it. For me, uh, when I got into multifamily real estate, what I wanted to do is I wanted to make $30,000 a unit. Um, when I was flipping properties, I wanted to make $60,000 a unit minimum. Um, and on commercial property now, I want to make a million dollars minimum, but right now I'm at about $500,000 minimum profit. Uh, my mentors and my partners, they do have a million dollar minimum. Uh, one of my partners made $8 million last year, net profits. Um, so it's possible. Uh, you just have to set your goal ahead of time and not uh, a shoot as you're going along. You actually, every war is won before a shot's ever fired. That's how you need to be approached things. And uh, yeah, don't use an A strategy to accomplish a Z, a Z goal. So uh, understand your goals and implement. Uh, part of that is don't, don't take a wholesale approach to try and achieve, you know, a million dollar goal because, you know, there's not a lot of wholesalers who are netting a million dollars at the end of the year. I know a couple of them, but uh, I, I don't want to take my chances on things. I want to set a strategy that I know I can implement and hit. Our goal this year is to do $10 million in profit. Um, and, you know, we are set on target to do that. So it's going to be good. But I, I, I tell you, if I tried to implement any other strategy to it, it wouldn't work. Okay. Um, and the biggest thing, as you guys can tell, I'm a very, very uh, spiritual, godly man. Um, one of the hardest things that I, I think that a lot of people um, do in our industry is they block their blessings. That uh, God wants to see all of us win. Um, sometimes we see Instagram and we see a lot of people winning. So a lot of people are probably watching this and they're like, oh man, I'd never be able to do what that guy do. Uh, I'm really not that smart. You ask a lot of people that I know they're like, dude, Javier is like the most average guy that you'll ever meet. Um, but I think one of the things that caused me to win tremendously was I stopped getting in my own way. A lot of the times I had a lot of great deals get in front of myself and my natural instinct was, hey, you know what? I, you know, that, that's too good to be true, right? Oh, wow, this, this, is, this is fantastic, but yeah, it's not me. You know, I, 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 re I, really, I really wish I was ready for this. Nobody's ever ready for anything, right? I, I wanna be very clear. Nobody is ready for their growth. No, but you'll never be ready to be, to get to that next level. And you're going to have to go, you're gonna have to go through it you're going to have to grow through it to get to where you want to be. Okay. And you cannot block a blessing. Uh, a lot of the times is that we have so many incredible things that get in front of us. It's that we just don't believe in ourselves. So you need to get out of your own way and stop blocking your own blessings uh, and, and embrace that, right? You have something amazing in front of you, embrace that. If somebody tells you it doesn't work, well, that's great. That's why they're not winning, right? That's why God gave you that blessing and not them. A lot of people, they don't want to see you win and they don't want to see you do better than they're doing. So don't let them think that their opinion is the truth, okay? So don't get in the way of your own blessing. Don't block your blessing. If, you're, if you have a blessing in front of you, hold on to that blessing and thank God for that. Take advantage of that blessing. It's there for you, okay? So I'm going to break down right now. Do I have a map? Yes, awesome, very cool. So I'm going to go through, this is a gold nugget for anybody who wants to get into uh, uh, owning real estate and they want to strategize for success. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you a strategy that I use for multifamily development. Uh, these are things that you can do for uh, single family flipping. All of these principles are going to be applicable in every single side of business that you are currently doing. Um, you can do office buildings, you can do nursing homes, you can do absolutely anything. And I swear, I swear it is this simple. So again, don't block your blessing and let's finish this webinar and I'll show you guys how to do it. Okay. So I'm going to start with the end in mind. These are the hot areas and I'm going to show you how we got there. Okay. So what I did is I started with the end in mind. Okay. So right now, I think, uh, when I, when I was doing this, uh, example, I was looking for a new apartment building site that I wanted to build, okay? So I am doing one building right now that we are gonna be selling it for $380 a square foot, 
Okay. And that's how you want to use when you are buying and renovating or buying and building property, you want to use a price per square foot as your determining factor on anything. Again, this isn't for rental. This isn't for anything else. This is for if you are buying a building and you are going to either build it or you're going to improve it, you want to use a price per square foot. So what I realized was most of the stuff that I was doing right now, I was selling between $300 to $400 a square foot. My conversation was everything that I knew there, $300 to $400 a square foot was good. You know, it's fantastic. It's good. You're making decent money, right? You buy it at $150, you put another $100 into it. You know, uh, you're in it $250 a foot and you sell it for $300. You make $50 a foot. That's freaking awesome, right? That's really, really good. Um, but I realized was I was playing in the 300 to $400 ranges. And um, what I did was I went to CoStar and I looked up all of the sales comparables of all of the apartment buildings that were selling between 300 to $400 a square foot in my market. Okay. So most of you, uh, if you're familiar with Tampa and Clearwater, I've got a TV up here, by the way. So like, I'm not like weirdly looking off in the distance. I have a TV. It's really cool. Um, and I pulled up all of the apartment buildings in Tampa, Florida that were selling between 300 to $400 a square foot. Okay. So these are the hot zones. If you can tell that down here, this is downtown St. Petersburg. You have St. Pete Beach, you have clear, uh, clear water. These are your popular areas. You have Hyde Park, you have downtown, you have South Tampa, all these areas. You have Carrollwood up here, all of the hot zones. 300 to 400 basic, super easy. These are most of the deals that you guys are seeing right now. If anyone's in my market, which most people want to be, but you can't because there's not enough real estate. So you got to build. Okay. Next slide. Now I did 400 to 500. Okay. So what I did is I started tearing out, Hey, where are my 300 to 400? Okay. They're in this zone. Okay. Where are my 400 to 500? They're in this zone. So you got downtown Tampa, you got Clearwater and you got downtown St. Pete. Okay. That fell off very quick. Okay. Well now we did the 500 to 700. Okay. Now, if I buy a 500 to seven, if I, if I sell it at 500 a, a foot and I buy the property at 150 a foot, and I put in 150 or I put in hundred a foot, I'm in it 250 a foot, but I'm doubling my money now. Instead of making $50 a foot, I'm making $250 a foot. And on a thousand square foot house, for example, that's $50,000 profit versus a $250,000 profit. Let's keep going. So now this is the thousand dollar a square foot and more, right? This is, this is the holy grail. Any market, if you're selling property above a thousand dollars a square foot, I want to shake your hand because that's a really good market. I'm not doing that yet, but that's the goal. Okay. So as you can tell here, these are the super bougie areas. These are really nice. If you have any property above a thousand dollars a square foot, you're freaking killing it. Um, that's so good. A thousand dollars a square foot, but there's only so many people who actually can afford that. And only so many people who actually want to be spending that kind of money. I'm not that guy right now. Um, I'm kind of like a, a, a balling on a budget kind of thing. I love properties that are inexpensive to get into, but your average buyers like a of luxurious real estate companies that are yeah, asset management firms or anything that are going to buy. I like your, I like your players that like to buy at the 500, you know, between 400 a foot to about 800. A foot. Hey, Javier, you are frozen. So Am I frozen? Oh, you're not now. Okay, cool. Sorry about that. Okay. As you can tell, the building that we're in obviously doesn't have the best Wi-Fi. That's a pretty good building. Um, but yeah, this building actually traded for $1,000 a foot, which is pretty cool. So next. Um, so we did the 1000 And basically what we're doing is that you're creating a heat map of what areas are doing the best price per square foot. So for example, I'm looking at apartment buildings. These are all of the apartment buildings in Tampa, Florida that are selling, you know, from low to high. Okay. So this is thousand dollars a square foot higher, um, really, really super properties and, um, cool. 
So then what I did was I take my, I take CoStar, as you guys can tell is again, being very cheap. I don't like having high marketing budgets. Okay. For me is the less that I spend and the more that I sell, that's the more that I get to keep. If I have a very high marketing budget, that means 99% of the times I'm going to have a huge overhead and I'll be making short-term decisions. What I like to do is I actually like to buy the majority of my properties off of the MLS uh, using CoStar, using Crezzy, using uh, Stellar. Sometimes we use that. Um, but what I like to do is, is that I like to look at the market and you can actually filter on the uh, MLS. You can filter what is the price per square foot that a market, that a property is being advertised. Okay. So now I want to flip. Now we're on CoStar and we're looking at active properties selling between zero and $50 a square foot. Okay. So as you guys can see, we have one property here, uh, active 50 to a hundred dollars a square foot. Okay. And you can see a few of these markets, you can see all these active properties. And I highlighted areas that I knew were hot. Okay. And now we see the active 100 to 200. And if I buy a property at 200 and I put 100 into it, most properties sell for about $50 a square foot in Tampa, right? Or I'm sorry, they sell for 500 a square foot commercially when it's all done up. So I, I really didn't want to find too many properties that were that much more expensive, okay? So one of the things that I started looking at was, okay, well, what properties... Uh, you know, what areas were generating the best, the best, uh, the highest prices per square foot, but were consistent. Okay. So if you go back through all of these markets, right, you see the hot zones. I just took squares, right. And you find all of the properties that were selling at the lowest price per square foot. And then they got hotter at the higher, the price per square foot. Okay. So you can do this. I did this. I screenshotted it and I put it on Google slides. I think it was, and I just took squares. And I, and I overlaid the maps that I had and I said, hey, this is the zone where I saw a lot of property selling for. And I was able to take those areas and I put squares and I put squares and I put squares and the redder that the squares were was is that the more volume that I saw in that market. So the chances of me finding any property, and if I didn't find something on the MLS, that's okay. I use my own company and we'll go out and we'll go find some property and we'll go buy something. Um, but I needed to know when I go pull my list, where am I pulling my stuff? Okay. So taking this hot zone and using these rectangles is a very easy way to break it down. But then taking where a lot of these shapes started to overlap, it looked like this. Okay. So what I did was I took all of those squares and I started giving myself circles. And I said, these are the areas that I'm going to be prop buying property in because I knew that I would be able to sell it for the most amount of money, okay? And then to actually jump back to what I was showing you guys before with the active properties, I was able to then find my active price and my active properties that were on the MLS. I didn't have to, I didn't spend one single dollar other than paying for, for CoStar, it's like 500 bucks a month. Um, I was able to literally find active properties on my hot zones that were able, you know, I was able to call an agent, make an offer, give a price and everything was right there. So I ended up, I, I decided that this area was a little cheap for me. Carrollwood, it's not there just yet. I actually have a property right there right now. That's where my 66 unit is. I'm very familiar with it, but it's still a little hood. It's still a little cheap property selling for about 400 a square foot. Um, what I saw was I wanted to be in an area that was selling for about 500 a square foot. And that was in these two zones right here. So uh, between these two properties that were active, I ended up uh, calling this property right here. Uh, it was a church uh, that was vacant. We checked with the zoning committee and we could not tear it down. Unfortunately, it was deemed historic. So I ended up calling the agent up here and I ended up uh, contracting this property at, what was it? We ended up contracting this property at ask um, and it was $94 a square foot that I put it under contract for the market price for that type of building was $154 a square foot. So I'm already buying at $60 uh, below market value. Um, but once we raise rents and take it to a serious commercial level to what we're going to be able to sell it for, we're going to be able to sell this property for about 
uh, I think 300 a square foot because I'm actually not even doing apartments, which is really funny of how I stumbled into this property. Um, I actually was able to uh, contract this property with the hopes of uh, either demolishing it or uh, 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 turning the office building into uh, residential apartments. Come to find out when we contracted the building and, um, and, and we got you know the pro formas and all the rent rolls and everything that was in it. Come to find out, we put the property under contract for the low $2 million, about 2.2 is what we're, uh, we're acquiring the property for. Um, you know, $2.2 million was the acquisition price. And then when you go under contract, you get all of the due diligence material. When I got all of the due diligence material of how much money they're actually making every single month, I found out the building was making $22,000 a month. So for anybody who knows how to run just mortgages on the back of your hand, uh, every million dollars is about 5,000, uh, I'm sorry, is about, yeah, $5,000 a month. Um, so $2 million, right, $2.2 .2 million, that's about $10,000 $10, a month. Well, if I'm making $22,000 and my debt service is only $10,000, I'm, I'm keeping, you know, about twelve to $13,000 a month. Um, you know, then you got some, you know, over overages and expenses, and then you find out the building's being under rented. We're actually acquiring a building that is underperforming, and we're we're going to be able to raise rents um, easily uh, without having to do anything to the property. So I actually started with the end in mind of finding an area that was highly desirable, and that's kind of what I wanted to get at with this this heat map is no matter what kind of property that you're looking for, before you start buying lists, you want to create a heat map. And there's different apps that can help you do it if you're really good with you know, this kind of stuff and what I was going over makes sense. When you start with the end in mind of what areas are the most desirable in your market, if you just find what markets and zip codes and, and subdivisions and like that are actually, people are paying the most amount of money, whether you're buying an office building, an apartment building, a, uh, a nursing home, whatever it is, 99% of the times, if a lot of people are spending money there, you're going to have a much higher result. So we uh, ended up going into this, uh, this deal, hoping to have um, a residential apartment building that we would be doing, come to find out that this building um, is going to uh, uh, net us every single month, probably you know, $10,000 in net cash flow once we raise rents a little bit and, and, and reduce expenses. And um, hopefully when we go to sell it, make us a couple million dollars because that residential area that people are paying a lot of money for, well, they're actually turning around and, and they're, they're renting in this space, you know, a, a office space for really, really high amounts as well. So um, when you start with that end in mind of where you're looking, okay, it's gonna make your buys you know, buying cheap property and improving it much, much easier because you already know and the end in mind, there's already a lot of people spending a lot of money in that area. So I hope that was helpful. I hope this helps make somebody a couple million dollars. And I hope to meet you when you make that million dollars and you say, hey, Javi, I was watching, you know, your, uh, your webinar with foreclosures daily and I implemented this heat map I've helped a lot of people make a couple of millions of dollars. Like I love watching great people win. And um, so, you know, if this, this strategy does help you in your business, um, whether you're wholesaling, whether you're uh, developing, um, whether this was the one webinar that you did watch um, that caused you to say, hey, I'm going to make that jump, uh, you know, God bless you. And I hope you win tremendously. So this is what I do. Uh, I do a lot of heat mapping on any type of the developments that we do, any properties that we search, any of my consulting clients that I work with. Um, this is the first thing that we start with is we start with heat mapping and where do people want to be? Find the cheapest property you can in that area. Do as little as possible to it and sell it for the absolute most. Tangie, that's all I got. I'm open for questions now. Okay, that was fantastic. The content you dropped, I'm gonna go ahead and um, share my screen real quick too, because I have your contact information on there. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that back up there right after I talk about uh, our pricing and stuff, because that's a lot of questions 
that people typically have is what are our pricing. We only have a few questions though, so you did a good job. Um, you know, a lot of people think that we give all of this data for this price below, and it's actually for one list type. So if you want probate, it's $5.99 for 12 weeks, three months, uh, $9.99 for 26 weeks, and then of course $1,750 for a year. And we usually charge 50% off for each county. But for anybody who's watching the webinar tonight and they mentioned that they saw this webinar, um, they're going to get a free county between now and Friday, but they have to buy at least the six month or the year. So I think you can agree, Javier, when you make a commitment, you want to make it longer term. It gives your list time to produce and function for you. That's why we give the free county on six month or the year and not the three month, because we want them to give more of the commitment because you want to give your list time to function and flourish and produce for you so that you have time to effectively do your marketing campaign, your cold calling and whatnot. So if you want probate for six months, it's $9.99, a year is $17.50. If you want pre-probate, it's another $9.99, the year is another $17.50. Now, the difference between pre-probate and probate, because I forgot to mention that earlier, a pre-probate means that they died last week, we verified there's real estate attached, and then we give the lead to you one week later. The benefit of using a pre-probate is not only are you first at the door, but if they inherit the property via a trust, you can buy now, no lines, no waiting. And then there's probate. So a pre-probate is one week after the death. A probate is one week after they file. We verify there's real estate attached and we give the lead to you one week later. Now, the benefit of using a probate is if they do have to go through probate, well, at least they've already filed and they could be closer to making a decision. Now, I know in Florida, in a lot of states, you don't have to wait for the probates to finish before you can buy the property. You can actually take ownership pretty quick, almost right away. But these are the prices. You buy between now and Friday. You do get a free county just for mentioning this webinar. My contact information is down below. So go ahead and take a picture of that because I got to move to Javier contact information because that's what most of you are going to want. So let's give them time to take a picture of that. Um, do you agree with what I said, Javier? You got to make a longer commitment to give your list time to produce and function. Everybody wants it now, you know? And Yeah, I mean, like, like exactly what I was saying. It's, it's if you don't start with the end in mind, right? You're going to buy a list and then you're going to put that list through. And because you didn't get a result that first month, you're going to think it was a bad list, right? Where most of the list and most of the marketing that, that you really need to do to implement is going to take you about six months to really see the full benefit of that. So right. I think most people, it's, I was listening to somebody today say, yeah, most people give up after the first 90 days because then there's something else that comes up and it sounds like a better idea. Just most people don't work their business hard enough. Nobody's consistent anymore. Everybody's in too much of a rush. And don't get me wrong, Pat. We've had people. I know a lot of, I know a lot of consistent people. I'll tell you that. But it's the ones who are consistent who are really winning. And they're winning big. So a lot of people is, you know, you don't want to give up. You don't want to block that blessing by saying, hey, you know what? Oh, that looks, you know, the green looks a little, uh, uh, the grass looks a little bit greener over there. You don't want to be blocking your blessing. You want to be thinking, hey, you know what? How does this affect my one-year goal? Right. And I think you guys, you guys need to do a longer term. You need to tell people, say, Yo, if you buy a list, you're going to keep buying that damn list. Right. Because we want to see you win. And that's the only way that they're going to do it is stick with it. I mean, that, that's what we did with y'all. We've been, I've been working with you for what, years. five, six years now. Yeah. Many years. Yeah. I remember when you guys brought me up on stage and introduced me as your lead provider a long time yeah. ago. That was a scary I, day. I, no I mean, I've had people buy a list you know, mail it on a Wednesday when it comes out and, and you know, the, the homeowner gets the, the count, the, the uh, list, the marketing on Saturday, they get a call, they go over on a Sunday and they're closing a deal. I mean, it can happen that fast, but you just don't try something for a little bit and then give up. You know, it's like one okay. shoe in, one foot out the door, you know, when you make smaller commitments. Yeah, so. well, yeah, you have to realize that you're coming into somebody's life and it's not about what you want is that you're, you're coming in long-term to help somebody. So I think that what you guys are doing is that you're getting in front of the right people at the right time. It's just whoever is implementing it, they need to realize is that, you know, it, this kind of stuff, it doesn't happen super quick. You know, real, real estate's not a get rich quick, but it's a get rich for sure. So I do have a few questions. Um, what a couple of people want to know, what's a pro forma? Mm -hmm. So pro forma is the performance of the actual investment. So you can Google what a pro forma is, a real estate pro forma. You can actually look up uh, different types. They have different templates and different models. Uh, but the first pro forma that I really use uh, was a super simple, you can go to rehabvaluator.com 
And that's a very simple, it you know, asks you for the acquisitions price. It asks you for how many square feet. It asks for you for how much, um, uh, uh, how much money that you're going to be putting into the property and what you sell it for. But a pro forma tells you of what are you going to put in the property? What are you going to sell it for? What are you going to get out? And normally it'll tell you an ROI, so a return on investment. And if you're doing any type of deal, you want your return on investment to be about a minimum for me is 30% return on investment. Um, and then you can get into IRRs and that's an internal rate of return. So if a deal takes two years, it's basically what you're going to be generating every single year. But to answer your question, a pro forma is how does the deal perform? What was the website that you mentioned? I'm not sure. What what about. What rehab, R-E-H-A-B, Valuator, V-A-L, you waiter. I'm not even going to try it. It's like 6 p.m. So rehabvaluator.com. Okay. So um, it says, thanks, Javier, for sharing. What platform do you use for your heat maps? Uh, so I actually, I, I use uh, a Google Maps um, for most of my stuff. I actually just, uh, I'll go to CoStar and I'll screenshot um, so, you know, my, my 300 to 400 square foot and I'll screenshot that. And um, I'll actually just draw a shape over it. So I, you know, you don't have to, you, you don't have to overcomplicate it. Um, they have other apps out there. I haven't found an app that I really, really like that was really simple. Um, but Google Maps uh, has a Google Drive actually has a My Map feature that you're able to create a map and you're able to actually upload Excel sheets on top of it. It's really basic. They only allow you to get so many uh, so many uh, 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 sets of data on there. But if you Google other heat map tools and everything else like that, everybody, what I've learned is a lot of people learn differently. So I recommend just Googling real estate heat map tools and then just try a couple and see which one that you like the most. Because what works for me, it might not work for you. You know what I love about you guys is you're not you're not selling anything. You're just giving away free content and you're sharing what God blessed you with. Mm, and I, yeah. I, that's so awesome. You know, you don't see that much these days and we really, yeah, I don't want, I don't want my pain to go in vain, but my hourly rate is $500 an hour. If you want to do consulting, <laughs> but, no, I mean, and seriously though, is, is when I was growing up in real estate, nobody, nobody came to me and said, Hey, you know what? This is how you can make your life easier. And by, by you winning, the whole world will win. And I think that we get these blessings to give blessings. So I hope that, you know, whoever sees this and does get blessed, you know, they turn around and you know, make the world a better place. Yeah, you, get, you gave everybody a, a bunch of free knowledge. Um, question, um, do you actually do coaching? Somebody asked. Uh, I do. I do consulting. So I have a, a 3000 a month dollar package. So what we do is we do uh, two hours uh, a week. Uh, monthly, it's, you know, $3,000 or I do $500 an hour uh, for one-on-one -on -one consulting. See, and you didn't even mention that. And that's not even what this call was about, but we had somebody interested in your, because you talked and you did so good and they saw everything right. you're doing and everything that you've had your hands in. People really cling to that and they, they want to know how they can duplicate that success. Yeah. So I've learned most people, most people don't implement. So I don't, I don't like talking about it uh, as much. Um, normally is, uh, when the student is ready, the teacher will show up. Um, so I, I don't want to sell anything and take anybody's money. I want to help somebody get to that next level when they feel it's the right fit. So how they reach you is, um, this is your uh, Instagram down bottom, correct? Yes, ma'am. Suarez underscore capital. That's me. And then you've got Javier at the Suarez capital.com. And then me. you have clearskip.com where he can help you with all of your investor needs getting your your lead skip trace somebody asked earlier what skip tracing was it's mm -hmm. obviously when you have a list of people names and addresses you send them over to clear skip and they'll send them back with like up to 10 phone numbers and emails right yeah the biggest issue that most people get is is that they get an amazing lead list from you and then they'll go to another uh, a provider that's going to give them data of uh you know either the owner before a tenant that was in the property or they're not going to even be able to find you know relevant information they might find the right person but maybe their old phone number and most of the people that you deal with is you know old data so what we do what skip tracing is is that we get you the most relevant information to contact the people that you want to get in touch with 
So we do 10 phone numbers, 10 email addresses, and an updated mailing address. Um, whatever your style is, we'll help you get in front of them and close the best deals. I mean, I'll tell you, I, I would never, using any other company, I never would have been able to get my last half million dollar profit deal if it wasn't for using my own company, Skip Tracing. So my company has a 4.7 star rating because all of our clients are making millions of dollars off of us and I use my own product. So um, we make sure is that our customer service and our data accuracy is on point. Well, that's what made you start a skip tracing company, right? Is you were using one, right? And you just said, you know what? I can do this and I can do better. <laughs> you know? Well, you know, you know what for, for us it was, is that it, it was, it was another company that was doing skip tracing, but they didn't care about the end result. And they just, they, they, they just wanted to collect the, you know, a couple bucks from us. Um, but they didn't care about the accuracy. You know, we were getting 50% hit rates and stuff like that. Um, I started our companies because I didn't trust anybody else. And I wanted to be able to use a company that when I went to go pull a list, I knew I was going to get the maximum amount of results. So we are famous for our 95% hit rates. Um, because if we ever do get something that has a lower hit rate, 99% of the times it's a formatting issue. Um, so we're able to take, uh, you know, lists and you don't have to upload on the template, but we literally have a department that is dedicated to making sure that your list are going to get the highest amount of skip traces. Possible. Now you guys get like a two hour return. Uh, what yep. is it? So we have, we have a two hour uh, turnaround. So we don't have an actual uploading, uh, into like a computer kind of system. Uh, what you do is you actually, you go to our website, clearskip.com and you pick what package that you want to skip trace and you upload the Excel sheet that you have and you upload it as is. So there's no formatting. There's no, nothing else. You just, you tell us what you want to pay for. You tell us what you want to get, you upload your file. And we actually go in to your skip trace, to you, to the lead list that you've uploaded to us. And we go through manually and we clean up the streets and no STs and it comes in a street and it's, I mean, it's an egregious process, but just to make sure is that our clients get the most out of every single skip trace and every single list that matters to us uh, tremendously. See, that's what I love is you're, you're an investor, right? And you're all these other things and you have a skip tracing company. So you know what people want because you're doing it. So it's perfect. And, and I've never had a complaint you know, usually when you refer companies, you get a complaint here and there. I've never had one single person complain about your company. Mm -hmm. I love you know? that. Um, so, that's I mean, the, that's the best compliment you could give me, Tangie. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. All right. Well, we've got a few more minutes for some questions. Uh, how important was it for having a mentor for you at the start of it all? And I know you said in the beginning it was very important. So we know that it's important. But how do you choose the best mentor to actually has your best interest in mind? Mm, that's a great question. That is a great question. Um, for me was, I, I, I paid a lot of money to a lot of mentors and just because you pay a mentor doesn't mean they're the right fit. Um, what I did was I actually asked the people around me that cared about me the most, um, people who were doing really well. And I actually asked them, Hey, I have this problem. Who can I talk to who would help me solve this problem? That's actually how I got started on my mentorship journey. As far as finding the right mentors, they actually pointed me in the direction of guys who were doing significantly uh, uh, well, but also had solved and have been solving the same problems for people. Just because somebody's a mentor doesn't mean they're going to be the right mentor for you. So I want to be very clear with that. Um, don't just throw money because someone's doing well. You want to find somebody who's going to help you solve the problem. So the mentor isn't going to be your one-all save-all, but you need to define your problem and find a mentor for that. I've got a mentor spiritually. I got three mentors. I got four mentors in my business. I got personal mentors. Um, and then uh, uh, you want to uh, listen to the people as you're on your professional journey as well right? That actually speak into your life to say, Hey, um, you know, you've helped me win tremendously. Hey, can I help you win? And that, and those mentors, you actually don't even end up paying because you end up working together on a very similar goal. So just in summary on mentors, define your problem and pay that mentor. And the other mentors bring deals to the table and do deals together with those mentors. Okay. That's how there's two types of mentors, ones that you pay and the ones that you play with. We have seven minutes to answer multiple questions. So we're going to go kind of quick. The website was in the beginning of the call, Javier. She wants to know about Cindy says, 
the website in the beginning of the call was investoffices.com or something? Yep, investinoffices.com. Investinoffices.com. That's yep. what she wrote, but it did not come up. Investinoffices.com. Investinoffices.com. Yeah, it should be there. I was there earlier today. While you're looking for that, can you yep. can your skip tracing company capture the name and contact information of the successor trustee or living trust? I can actually answer that because we we send a lot of people your way when they skip trace the pre-probates. And what's unique about his company, never saw this at any other company, guys. Other companies will do family members. His company specializes in getting you the most likely to be the next of kin. The most likely to be the next of kin when they're doing their skip is the person who's mentioned the absolute most in the skip tracing. And they're usually right on point. I mean, you know, every, everybody's going to give you a lot of different phone numbers, guys. Some are going to be awesome. Some aren't going to be that great, but they are really good at getting you the most likely to be the next of kin when you don't have a PR on your list. Um, the cost of clearskip.com. So uh, the cost of clearskip.com, uh, absolutely priceless. Um, I, I, I wish we had a lot higher pricing. We actually have the best pricing in the industry. Um, a non-bulk. So if you're just doing like one to 10 skip traces, you're going to be at about 25 cents with our company. If you're doing 5,000 records or above, you're going to be at about 13 cents per record on our company. Um, for the LLC skip tracing, I think we're at 30 cents. Um, and then probate, we're at 30 cents as well. But they, if they get my discount code, they get it a lot cheaper. Exactly. But yeah. if you know Tangie, if you know Tangie, you you're buy the to get significant, yeah. yeah, you're gonna, you got a nice little hookup there. You can't call them up and say, hey, we know Foreclosure Daily. You have to be a member of Foreclosure Daily and you, I won't give you the code until you are. Yep. So um, yeah, I beat him up over that actually. <laughs> that <price. laughs> so yeah, everybody else. Every time it. I see. <laughs> You know, let me live that down. How do you feel about the hard money and OPM? Uh, hard money is great, uh, but OPM will change your life. Um, the thing about hard money is you're going to be paying anywhere from 8 to 12. It's, I mean, pretty standard. Uh, what we do is we actually use a blend of both. So we use hard money for normally a first position loan. So that's going to cover about 80% of the total deal cost. And then what we'll do is we'll bring OPM in on the other 20%. So instead of having to bring a significant amount of other people's money uh, to the table, what we're, what we're able to do is we're only, we only have to bring in 20% of normally what a deal is, and you're only going to be paying maybe you know, a couple thousand dollars difference, but it makes the deal much, much smoother. So if you have a great hard money lender, um, you know if anybody's watching this right now, and I'll, I'll kind of give a little gift if you've waited to the end of this, you go uh, 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 send me an email. And I'll get you a $2 million line of credit uh, with one of my hard money lenders. Uh, you just have to send me an email above Javier at the Suarez and wow. I'll get you set up on a $2 million line of credit and they'll leverage you up to 90% on every single deal. That's actually that's a really amazing. good idea. Yeah, I, should, I probably should have started off with that one. Wow. But that's, <laughs> yeah, I've got, I've got a $10 million line with them. We've done really well together. Um, so that's a deal that I have worked out with them as well. Um, I want to make sure is that people have every opportunity in the world to be able to win. So to reiterate that, if you email him, Javier at the Suarez capital.com, he will get you set up. What now? $2 million. Uh, yeah. A $2 million line of credit uh, to go buy single family or, you know, really any type of real estate. Email him guys right now. So Javier, this was fantastic. Dylan says, thank you, man. Would you apply the same principle to single family homes and short-term rentals? Uh, short-term rental. I'm, I'm not an expert in short-term rental as much as I'd love to uh, be. Um, I use Airbnb. I, I don't, I don't rent it. Um, I would implement the single family strategy. Um, I, I think that if you're doing single families right now, you should implement my heat map strategy in building new construction, single family homes. That is the best strategy that you can be doing right now, I think. And you can scale that business to a multi-million dollar level right now. Um, if you look for the single family homes that are selling at the highest price per square foot in your market, if you target the lots in those areas, you're going to have a lot higher chance of generating a lot more revenue there. 
Is CoStar your company and how much is the service? <laughs> I wish. Oh my God. Uh, so CoStar is a national brand. It's actually a global brand um, based out of Washington, DC, but is not my company. It is the MLS for commercial real estate. It is the most helpful tool in the world. If you thought the MLS for residential real estate was good, it is like uh, that 98 old uh, uh, a Toyota Camry, which was my first car versus like a 2020 Rolls Royce, uh, co-stars the Rolls Royce, the MLS that you guys use for residential real estates, the, uh, the, the old Camry. We got about one minute. Are these services offered just here in Florida? We're nationwide here at Foreclosures Daily. I think you're asking about us because we are nationwide. What about you? You're nationwide for ClearSkip, yes? Yeah, co uh, what do you call it? ClearSkip, we do nationwide and uh, my investment consultant. You're frozen. These principles that I have, you can apply them nationwide. Okay. Yes, there's a discount on ClearSkip. If you, if you purchase our services, you do get a discount code set up by me. Um, so do you upload 10 numbers and addresses into your outbound marketing or start with the next of kin and then move on? Yeah. So when you get the 10 numbers with us, we normally tell our clients is that you want to start with the first two to three columns. So phone one, two, and three. To you're frozen again. Um, you're still frozen. You're still frozen, buddy. Hold up. All right, you're back. You're back. So oh, Anthony, back? if you could answer okay, that hold. question one more time. Yeah, so the 10 phone numbers, what we normally recommend is for the first three columns, so phone one, two, and three, to be the ones if you're calling and texting. And then if you have Facebook marketing, you actually want to upload all 10 columns to Facebook to help find your clients. Normally the first, the first three columns with your phone numbers are gonna be the most accurate to call. Do you allow corporate leasing in your condo units? Uh, we actually do. Uh, ever, after COVID, uh, we do corporate leasing uh, and we also allow our tenants to operate home businesses out of our uh, apartments. Okay, no more questions, guys. I'm gonna ask these last two questions. Uh, how do we manage new construction with high inflation? Uh, you manage new construction by doing my heat map and having a preset sales strategy to build in a neighborhood that people want to be in because as inflation increases, right? People are already knowing that they have to pay more money. People will pay more money in new construction versus having to pay more money for a, a, a home that they're going to have a lot of issues with. Very, very easy, new construction. People are always gonna pay higher and you're always gonna sell that property for a pretty penny. Last question, what would make someone sell a property generating 10,000 profit and rent rolls, i.e. your 66 what years? Would some, what would make someone sell a property generating 10,000 profit and rent rolls? Half a million dollars in profit. Basically what it is, the reason that we sold the property um, and not uh, holding the property is the, for me to hold that property, I would have to hold it for 50 months versus collecting all of my profit within eight months. We were planning on holding it for 12 months. We sold it in eight months. I collected $80,000 in net cash flow, which was fantastic. But I also collected $500,000 in net profits versus having to hold it and wait a long period of time. I was able to take that money, reinvest it, and pick up two new deals that are going to generate us about $10 million in net profit. So what you're doing is you're expediting your cash flow. Awesome, awesome. Uh, Javier, I actually, um, I do I do want to talk to you offline. We, we've got a request for you to speak at one of the local RIA groups. So hopefully you'll do that for us, you know, soon. Um, I'll get with you after, but thank you so much for taking your hour and a half out of your evening. We've been waiting since last year to have you on. Really appreciate you. Great content. Remember guys, anybody who emails him, Javier at the Suarez capital.com, it's going to get you $2 million, right? Yeah. In it's a $2 million line of credit. So like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, yeah, I'm not going to wire 2 million bucks, but you'll have a line of credit for single family homes. You'll have a term sheet. Um, and you're going to be able to, to, to originate any deal and get it leveraged up to 90% and uh, just freaking kill it. So, so you can do new construction as well. So that's, it's really helpful. It's a nationally big company. They've got $2 billion in assets. So hopefully we can you know, help get a big chunk of that off. $2 million there. line of credit, guys. Email him right now. Thanks, Javier. Have a great evening and give the family our love. Will do. Thanks, Tange. Thank you.